All right. The prayer. Master of all worlds, highest power, merciful parent of compassion, in your presence, eternal one, source of strength for us, as you have been for our ancestors, we very humbly acknowledge you. What are we? What is our life that we, you have done such great kindness to us? Therefore, we place our appeals before you so that you may forgive and absolve us of all our faults and failings, that our faults never become barriers between us and you. And may it be your desire to prepare our hearts to feel awe and love for you. May you listen to these words of ours and may you open our encumbered hearts to the mysteries of your Torah. May this, our study, be a source of pleasure before your throne of glory like sweet incense. May you shower down upon us the light of our soul source in all the ways by which we define ourselves. May the sparks of your holy servants through whom you have revealed these words to the world shine and sparkle. May their merit, their ancestors' merit, and the merit of their Torah, their innocence, their holiness, stand for us so as to prevent us from stumbling when we study these words. In their merit, may our eyes be illumined by what we study, as in the saying of the sweet singer of Israel, open my eyes, that I may gaze into wonders of your Torah. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. For it is the eternal who grants wisdom. It is from his mouth that knowledge and understanding issue forth.
Good evening to everyone. We are on page 325, 325. And we started on the previous page a little story uh, about Rabbi Yitzchak. He's sitting down in front of this cave and uh, three people pass by, a man with his two sons, and he hears them talking to each other and it turns out that they uh, seem to be talking words of Torah and uh, that uh, the, um, the two brothers specifically are talking. And one uh, starts off by talking in a very general way about how the world needs the sun uh, and light in order to be sustained and the wind. And then the younger brother brings this to the story of Yaakov, and uh, that says, this is really what it's all about. If not for Yaakov, the whole world would not be able to uh, continue existing. But he brought the real, true unification um, together. Uh, Abraham and Isaac together become uh, uh, unified through Jacob. And then Jacob's sons, uh, take on that legacy. And we have the story about saying Shema, Shema Israel, listen Israel, the sons of Israel, Jacob, tell their father that they are also um, devoted to the, uh, uh, the one God. And then he creates the phrase Baruch Shem Kvod Malchut Toli Olam Vaed as uh, another unifying uh, uh, formula. And together the two formulae the verse from the Torah and the verse from a human being unite and bring the upper realm and the lower realm together. So that's where we left off. And that, uh, so that male and female would join as one, right? That's the upper and the lower as well. So at this point, <coughs> we'll start from Rabbi Yitzchak. We read, I think last time, but we'll start from there. Um, he's intrigued. And uh, he wants to uh, uh, see what's up here. And, and uh, we'll continue from there. So somebody is going to read for us, please. It looks like it's going to be Beryl. Well, you don't want me to go to sleep during class this way. <laughs> well, other people do. So that's, you know, it's all right. But go ahead. Rabbi Yitzhak said, I'll join them and hear what they're saying. He walked along with them. Okay. So this is good. So Rabbi Yitzchak is intrigued. We talked a little bit about it last time that he sees that the Torah is not the uh, sole possession of Rashbi and his students. Rabbi Yitzchak is one of the students. Uh, here we have these people who are completely uh, outside of the group and yet they're saying some very uh, uh, important uh, teachings and he decides to walk along with them. Um, I just wanna also kind of juxtapose um, what, uh, you know, what we're in the middle of in terms of our biblical uh, uh, story. And that is that uh, Jacob is, is the loner, right? Jacob is going along on the road all by himself. Jacob is going along on the road uh, full of trepidation. Will he be uh, uh, assaulted by, by wild beasts? By, by, will he get lost? Will his own brother come and kill him? Um, so he's, you know, isolated and alone in his walking. And here we have uh, three people walking together, a family, two brothers that get along with each other, apparently, and their father. And now Rabbi Yitzchak wants to join and follow along with them. And uh, he walked along with them. 
doesn't say that they get introduced to each other. It doesn't say that they say hello, that he asks permission. It just ends up that he becomes one of the one of the chevra as well. Okay, and uh, now we have one of the uh, these uh, three people uh, beginning uh, and uh, or continuing to talk Torah. And Rabbi Yitzchak is basically just a fly on the wall. He's just hanging on, uh, hanger on to what they're saying. Okay, that man opened. That man opened saying, Arise, O Yud, hey, Vav, hey, to your resting place, you in the ark of your might. Okay, so this is a verse that we uh, recite at the Torah service. Kuma Hashem I mean, Right? This is at the end. I mean, we're going to get to the other verse in a second. Um, this is at the end of the Torah service when we're putting the Torah back into the ark. And, uh, and uh, we have that verse. So he starts off with this verse. And what does he say? Arise, O yud hey vav hey to your resting place. Like someone saying... Let the king rise and go to rest, to his restful bedroom. Okay, so if we look at the verse, the verse could sound a little bit paradoxical. Kuma Hashem, which sounds like arousal, right? It sounds like, you know, ooh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get, you know, you'll come up, stand up straight, get going. Um, and yet it says, limnu chatecha, to your resting place, to your rest, to your repose. So the uh, reading that this man uh, um, offers, this is an invitation. Come, please. You know you've been you've you, you've you finished uh, dozing in Zohar class. Why don't you get up, get a nice warm cup of milk, go to sleep, enjoy yourself, be comfortable, right? So that's that's the it's an invitation, an invitation for God to uh, to to rest. Okay. Go ahead. There are two who said, Arise, O yud hey vav hey, Moses and David. Moses. And David is what we just had, right? David is the Psalms, right? So that's Kuma Shalom Nuchatecha. Arise, God, to come to your uh, repose, your resting place. But Moshe also did it. That's the verse I was saying before. Go ahead. Moses said, Moses said, Arise, O yud hey vav hey, may your enemies be scattered. David said, Arise, O yud hey vav hey, to your resting place. What is the difference between them? Moses spoke like someone enjoining his house, enjoining her to wage war against his enemies. Okay, so really quickly, um, what we have in, in uh, note 42. Moses spoke like someone enjoining his house. Moses commanded Shina. Okay, that's good. That's enough for us for right this second. In other words, we're reading. This is two different kinds of, um, you know, it, it's all in the in the intonation. They both say Kuma Hashem, but when David says it, it's you know, in, you know, being gentle. God, please, why don't you, you know, just come this way, and and uh, and and come to you know to become more comfortable. And Moses is commanding. Moses says, Kuma Hashem, get up, get up, get going. Be a futsoi vecha, so that your, your enemies will be scattered. Why we need you to, you know, to, to get off your, your, your seat and, and get moving and doing things. So it's much more active. And the statement itself is also uh, more, more imperative. And uh, um, who, who has a right to say such a thing to God? Right? Who can say that? Um, uh, the, the answer is someone enjoining his house, right? Someone who is commanding his household or his wife, um, enjoining her to wage war against his enemies, right? Because Moses is the boss. Moses is, as the rest of the note says, Ish HaElokim. She, Moses is the Almighty's man, right? The Almighty's husband. So Moses has this power um, to uh, uh, 
goad on God into action. Before we get into the rest of the discussion here, um, this should also uh, echo or reverberate, resonate, whatever the word we want to use here, uh, something in that we had before in the Jacob story. Who said to who said to who? There's a, there's in 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 Hebrew tests examinations. There's a traditional me amar el me. There's a, a, a standard uh, way that that teachers used to create examinations. Who said to whom? You had to know who the subject was, and you had to know who the object was. So um, who said to whom? Get up. Esav said it to Yitzchak. We had a little bit of a discussion. Does this show what what a what a crass and and disgusting uh, person Asa was? He didn't talk to his father with respect. Get up, old man. Come on and eat your food that I made for you. Remember that was the distinction that was made between Yitzchak and uh, between Yaakov and Asa. That Yaakov was gentle and Yaakov was solicitous of his father, and Asa said, "Yakum avi." My, my father should get up. So, uh, um, and then there was a suggestion, well, maybe not, maybe it's actually a kind of an invitation. Maybe it's a little bit more of a, of a soft, respectful kind of way of saying things. So we have a parallel here. Here we have two people talking to God. Is it in a chutzpah kind of way? Or is it in an invitational, solicitous kind of way? So here we have that David is doing the inviting. He's, he's the soft-spoken one. And Moses is the one who has the standing to be a little more uh, forthright and forceful. Okay, 326. David invited him to rest, like someone inviting his master, inviting the king along with the queen, as is written. Arise, O yud heh vav -Hey to your resting place, you and the ark of your might, so as not to separate them. Separate who? Who should not be separated? The king and the queen, right? So how do we find the queen in this, in this uh, uh, text? Shpina. How do, where? Or the ark, the ark. There you go. The ark is Shechina. The ark is the, is the receptacle of the Torah. The ark is the container that that uh, encompasses and and allows the the uh, the Torah to to uh, come into it. So she is the Aron Uzecha. She is the ark, the container of your might, of your of your O's. And of course, Torah is O's. Right? Hashem O's the Amo Yitain. Hashem Yivarech Damav Shalom. God gave owes the Torah to the Jewish people. So um, this is what David is saying. David is saying is what a wonderful opportunity and honor for me to greet you and your consort and your queen. Oh, king and queen, come, make yourselves comfortable and rest here, both of you together, um, and you can be comfortable with each other. So that is uh, the way that uh, um, that verse is being read by our, uh, our teacher here. Okay, now the next verse. May your priest be clothed in righteousness. May your faithful sing for joy. From okay, so this is another verse that we also use and at the, uh, at the end when we're closing the ark, right? Kohanecha yil bishut tzedek, v'chasidecha yiraneinu. Kohanecha, your priests, yil bishu, will be clothed or will dress up in righteousness, tzedek, v'chasidecha, here it's translated your faithful or your loving, pious ones, right from the word chesed, iranenu, will sing for joy, rina. Okay? Um, Beryl, don't go away so fast. <laughs> Larry. Yeah, well, also, just to go back a second, maybe it goes without saying, but uh, the Moshe's verse um, Kuma Hashem Yafutsu Oivecha. 
that was said when they were bringing the ark forward. But it's the same thing, it's the ark in both cases. One in an aggressive way, I mean, to go out to battle, and then the other coming, I, I think, coming back from battle, the battle's won, and David's putting, wants to put the, the ark in a temple, in the temple or in a temple. Right. So it's the ark is in both. Right. So, but but David is, is adding something that already existed in that text, as you point out, the verse that we have when the when the ark goes forward is Vaiheben so Aaron Vayomer Moshe Kuma Hashem Vyafutsu. That's the verse, right? So the verse begins with, and when the ark would travel, would start moving on, Moses would say this, right? So it's a kind of a performative statement. The ark is moving and, God, and Moses says, you know what, move, get moving, get, you know, so, uh, and then what does it say? Uvnucho yomar shuba Hashem rivavot alfei Yisrael, right? That the next verse in that text says, and when they came to rest, when they put the ark down, then they said, Shuvah Hashem, you God, relax. You are the God who's the host of all the myriads of, of, uh, of Israel, right? So there's already a verse in the Torah that, that uh, is allotted to inviting God to rest um, after, uh, after the battle or after the, tr the journey, after the activity. David is adding more. Right? David, David is adding beyond that. There's already a complete, you know, uh, verse, you know, and you know, one way and the other way. There's a there's there's a, a complementarity in the Torah, and now David adds more. <clears throat> okay, so now how do we read it back to the Psalms? The next verse. What is David saying? Up to you, Beryl. From here, we learn that whoever invites a king should alter his behavior to delight the king. If the king is accustomed to being entertained by common gestures, then he should arrange for him red-headed regal gestures and commanders. Or if not, then he himself for the king's amusement. Okay. So now we have the uh, our teacher saying, and we can learn a little derech eretz from this. We can learn how to, uh, a little etiquette, right? From the way that David spoke to God and what David offered as, as a host who is inviting God to, to take some respite in, uh, in David's house. From this, we can learn what it means to be a host uh, of, of a dignitary of a king in other situations. So what is this? What do we learn? We learn if you're inviting the king to come and visit, then um, whoever invites a king should alter his behavior to delight the king. You should do whatever it takes to make your guest happy, right? To make your guest enjoy themselves as as uh, as a guest in in your in your home. So if the king is accustomed to being entertained by common jesters. And he should arrange for him red-headed regal jesters. So let's look at um, 45. Red-headed regal jesters. Rufinus is a Roman name derived from the Latin Rufus, red-haired. Right, so the, the, te the term in the Zohar is bediki rufinus. Bediche rufinus. Bediche is like a bedicha, a joke. A bediche is jokers, jesters. Right, Rufinus, Rufinus type jesters. So he's translating Rufinus type as redheaded, red haired. Okay. The name is shared by various early Christian saints, a fourth century Roman minister, Antinius Rufus, the second century governor of Palestine, ordered by Emperor Hadrian to crush the Jewish rebellion. Okay. So that's all um, fine. We're going to skip the rest of those citations. Um, who else was red-haired? <coughs> Asa, right? Asa was all red, 
right? Edom, that's why he's called Edom, right? The red one. Um, who else was a redhead? My father was a redhead. David, David was a redhead. Yes, and David was also a redhead. So what does this mean here, these redheaded jesters? Um, you know, what, what, what's the, why is that being singled out here? We'll have to see if we can, you know, if we can come to, uh, to any insights uh, as we keep on going. Okay. So jesters, commanders is his, is his speculative translation uh, based on other uh, um, texts. And if not, he himself should dance and, and cavort and, and, and uh, entertain the king. Whatever the king's taste is, even if the king's taste goes toward the common, right? It's the, the, the guest is the boss. The guest is the boss. Also, Badhan comes from Badicha as well, a jester in a, in a traditional right. Correct. Correct. wedding ceremony. Yes. Correct, right. A Badhan means one who does Badichot. Right? The Nun is the one who does the following. Right? Kablan, right? Badhan. Um, Shadhan. Right, is someone who does shiduchim, so um, matchmaking. Right, all of those. That's what the nun does. Good. So, and as the note points out, David does dance before God. David dances before the ark when the ark is retrieved from the Philistines. Um, uh, he got it from Richard Gere. Um, you know, they taught him everything he knew about this. That's uh, in the movie. And uh, he got in trouble for that, right? Does anybody remember what happened when David danced before uh, um, the ark? It didn't yeah, work. great. His wife mocked him and uh, total derision, and they were never together again afterwards. Right. They had they had a big falling out because she felt that he had belittled himself, that he had humiliated himself um, in public. And uh, he says, what are you talking about? How can it be a humiliation for me to dance before God? What kind of business is this? So uh, um, that's part of what, what's going on here in, in the Zohar. Whatever God likes, God gets. Okay, or you know, we should give God. Okay, come and see. Come and see. When David invited the king and queen to rest, what did he do? In place of the king's gestures, he substituted red-headed regal ones. Who? As is written, may your priests be clothed in righteousness. May your faithful sing for joy. May your faithful sing for joy. The verse should read, may your Levites sing for joy, for only they engage in joyous song. They are the royal gestures. Yet now, David, having invited him to rest, turned the priests and faithful into royal jesters. The Blessed Holy One said to him, Not so. He replied, When you are in your palace, you act according to your will. But now that I have invited you, it depends on my will, which is to present those more distinguished ones, even though it is not their habit. Go one more time, go ahead, go one more verse. From here we learn that in his own house, one may arrange things as he pleases, but when invited out, he should fulfill the will of his host, whatever he arranges. For look, David replaced the Levites with priests, yet the blessed Holy One affirmed the matter according to his wish. Okay, so, um... You know what, let's, let's just uh, um, go to the end. Go ahead. David exclaimed, for the sake of David, your servant, do not reject the face of your anointed one. This is also one of the verses that we say at the end. I said, Ba'avur David Abdecha al tashev mishichecha. Right? Then we go, Ki lekach tov natati lachem torati al tazov. Right? Eitz cha yemi, etc. Go ahead. May the arrangement I prepared not be rejected. The Blessed Holy One replied, David, by your life, I will not even use my own vessels, but yours instead. 
the Blessed Holy One did not stir from there until he had given presents and gifts. As is written, yud heh vav -He swore to David a truth he will not renounce. Of the fruit of your body, I will set upon your throne. Rabbi Yitzhak came and kissed him saying, if I walk this way just to hear this, I am satisfied. All right, so very good. Um, but now let's try to make some sense of it. So David is inviting uh, the royal couple to come and stay with David, to come and stay in an abode that David has prepared for them. Right? And it says, uh, that your priests will be the ones who will be garbed in righteousness. And it is your faithful ones, chasidecha, the ones who are full of chesed, who will sing joyously to you. So the uh, Zohar, this uh, teacher, says, what do you mean? Singing belongs to the side of the Levites. The Levites are on the left-hand side, gvura, and the priests are on the right-hand side, chesed. So the chasidecha are the priests. Chasidecha don't sing. Chasid the, the priests are actually completely silent in their rituals in the temple. It's the Levites who sing. And for the Zohar, this, we've talked about this a few times, that the paradox is that music for the, for the Zohar is actually part of the left-hand side. It's part of gvura, it's part of stringency, it's part of uh, uh, limitation, judgment, um, and, and executing judgment. This is what, for the Zohar, music really comes from. So that's the Levite's uh, um, domain. So all of a sudden now, David is saying, let the priests sing before you. So what David is doing is actually switching what God has ordained. God has ordained that the Levites should sing and that the priests should be silent. The priests just do the sacrificial rites, but it's the Levites who accompany that with, 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 uh, with their singing. David says, let's do it the other way. Let's have the priests do some singing for you. So um, what did God say? The Blessed Holy One says, not so. You're doing it wrong. You've got the left and the right switched. You've got the left and the right uh, exchanged. Again, somewhat like when we have when uh, Jacob gives blessings to Ephraim and Menashe which is the left and the right. So God objects. What does David reply? When you're in your palace, you'll do it the way you want it. But you're not in your palace right now. You're in my home. And the way I like it is that the priests should do the ones who, are, who, who the, do, should be the ones doing the singing. And since you're in my home, humor me. Humor me. And God says, you're right, you're right, of course. And you're such a good host that as a result, I promise you that your children will always be uh, the ones who inherit your, your royalty and, and the dynasty will continue. So um, we got a little problem, right? If we look at, from here we learn on the, on the top of 327, how do we square that with um, the paragraph on 326. Okay, look at look at 326, um, the, where it says, "May your priests be clothed with righteousness, etc." Beryl, just from here we learn. Yes. So you want me to read 326 or 327? Both. First 326. May, you, may your priests be clothed in righteousness. May your faithful sing for joy. From here we learn that whoever invites a king should alter his behavior to delight the king. If the king is accustomed to being entertained by common gestures, then he, shall, he should arrange for him redheaded regal gestures and commanders. 
or if not, then he himself for the king's amusement. Okay, so that's the first one thing that we learn, right? So according to that, who calls the shots? Guest, not the host. Guest, right? Do everything. If you want to be a good host, then you should knock yourself out to arrange everything to the best liking and enjoyment of your guest. That's your obligation. Okay, now from here we learn, now 327. From here we learn that in his own house, one may arrange things as he pleases, but when invited out, he should fulfill the will of his host, whatever he arranges. For look, David replaced the Levites with priests, yet the Blessed Holy One affirmed the matter according to his wish. Okay, so here we have that there's an obligation on the guest to follow whatever the host wants. So what do we do with this? Maybe you could maybe you could reconcile it depends on who you're inviting. If you invite your parents over, it's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, good. So you're a you're a redheaded jester. There you go. Very good. Um, now I think I think it's a, it's a, it's a little strange, um, but I think what the Zohar is saying is um, that it actually goes both ways. That there's a kind of like a, um, you know when when people go at the, when they both come to the door at the same time, right? No, you go first. No, no, you go first. No, no, you go first. No, you go first. Um, each of the parties here at the party, the host has an obligation to be solicitous to the guest. The guest has an obligation to be solicitous to the host. Right? Each one has their own independent responsibility. How that plays out will then depend on the personalities, on the wherewithals, on the choices that, that uh, each side makes. Will the host bend over backwards to do everything the way the guest wants? Well, they should. But what if they don't? What if they end up feeling compelled to do certain things the way they feel it needs to be done? Then what? What does the guest say? Some host you are. You're not respecting what I like. Now respecting what I what what I prefer, so uh, you know uh, this is an insult. What happens here is that there's still this overriding responsibility on the part of the guest to show appreciation to what the what the host is giving them on their own terms. Right? So each one is supposed to be solicitous of the other. But then when it comes down to actually what happens, it may be that there's going to uh, uh, be a, a kind of a, a push that one side feels that, that uh, uh, um, you know, makes them go a certain way. I so don't... here, yeah, one second. Here, something is, is pushing, is compelling David. Something is pushing David to make this change. Um, so David wanted to say something and then we'll go to the chat. Yeah, I'm looking at 326 and 327. And is it not the case that the guest yields to the host? Although in 326, God is the guest. Correct. So according to the top of 327, the guest should yield to the host. You're right. But at the top of 326, it says the opposite. It says the host should prepare to make the guest comfortable by yielding to however it is that the that the host that the guest wants. I didn't go high enough on the page. Is that that's it? what we just read? Beryl just read both of those those texts. Look at look at where it says. From here we learn whoever invites a king should alter their behavior to delight the king. If you invite a king, the king is your guest. Do everything that you should that can be done to make the king happy according to what the king wants, according okay. to what the guest wants. And then on three twenty seven it says the opposite. Right? Yeah. 
So <clears throat> that means, so what I'm suggesting here is that if even though the regular etiquette should be that David should have followed everything that God wanted, he can't. Something is pushing David to do this other uh, arrangement, right? The, the, the king likes to have the fork on the left and David says, I cannot do that. I have to have the fork on the right, right? It's, it's, I, it's, it's not, it's not gonna work for me the other way. Um, so what now, of course, also let's understand what is David's famous accomplishment? Neim's Mirot Yisrael. He is the pleasant singer of Israel. When we when we say uh, um, right, don't we say that in our prayer at the beginning when we study that uh, um, the psalmist? That's David. David created all these songs. David had a harp. He got up uh, every 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 night and and played music and created new songs to God. And He's not a Levite, right? He wants the songs that he sings to be acceptable to God, even though they're not Levitically um, proper. Of course, the Levites end up singing his songs, but, uh, um, but he doesn't want the songs to be assigned to the left. They are officially part of the left hand side. And David is more like, uh, you know, like, like uh, the way I feel. Isn't music more on the right? Isn't music more on the right-hand side? So the tradition says no. No, God says no. Music is about measurement. Music is about discipline. Music is not noise. Music is not hard rock. No, music is melody and music is, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, all the, you know, the wonderful things that music can be, um, like Shakespeare says. But uh, um, this, is, this, is, uh, um, this is David's compelling need. And, the, and, and God goes for it. Right? God says, okay, if you're inviting me in, when we'll be in the temple, the Levites will sing the songs. But if you're inviting me in, then even though you should try to um, follow my, my preferences, if you can't, if you absolutely need to come close to me in this, in this way that works for you, then I'll accept it. And I'll appreciate it because this comes out of your extreme desire to, uh, to dance before me. To to uh, you know to uh, to sing before me. I don't know. That's that's what I can suggest at the moment. Um, and Rabbi Yitzchok. Oh, Mark said something. Wait, I gotta go to the chat. Can we connect this with the tension between divine mandate and human response? So I always get in trouble because these very pithy uh, remarks. Uh, are not enough for me. So now you're going to have to unmute and, and, and go for it. You, you, you know, the, the famous story about where Halakha gets decided. Uh, the freedom of human beings to respond to divine mandate in terms of their own understanding of it. So, so it's more than just it can be seen as a whole metaphor for the interaction between, again, just to repeat what I wrote, mandate and response. So it's not a matter of just following the mandate. It's a matter of accommodating the mandate to the human nature response. And then this has a deeper metaphysical issue because Shekhinah, which is the human context of religion, religion as construed within this world, as opposed to 
the source of all of this, which we can't grasp, but have to reinterpret in human terms. We can't okay. grasp it in itself, in and of itself. Right, so I think that, that everything that you're saying um, is, is very, uh, it, it's, it's, it's got a lot to it and it's germane. Um, but I think that what we have here is actually going even further because I would still think when I hear your, your description, I would still think that we would be um, called upon to do the best we can to satisfy the mandate, right? However, in our own paltry kind of way, um, we still do our interpretations, we still do our, our struggles, but it's all for the sake in the end of, of, of answering the mandate. But, right? but, but, but that, that would that, follow from what you were saying, correct? Well, Even if we do it imperfectly. I'm not quite sure that, that I mean, th th think about the big dispute between say the Hasidim and you know, the, the, the other kind of intellectual people who think that through studying Torah, you can actually it's find not, out. The, 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 mit, mit, mit nagdim. Mit nagdim. I mean, right. that's a very real issue within what it means to be a religious person. To what extent is to be a religious person, maybe in, in the Islamic tradition, which means that you just abdicate and just follow ritual. Submit, submit. Okay, submit. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Okay. And, and I think that that's a tension that's inherent in religion and that this issue of David being willing to make a fool of himself and in the story even supposedly exposing his private parts when he's dancing, uh, I, I heard the story once interpreted that way, that, 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 that's why his wife was so upset because when he was dancing, his, his robe opened up. And, and as long as this comes from his sense of commitment, he's actually violating the prohibition that you never expose yourself. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing all sorts of analogies, but, but, but there's really a deep issue and it gets to do with, you know, the relationship between Orthodox and conservatism, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how does a human being choosing to act in God's world, where God's world is the world, the God's world that we know is the world of human beings. So that, that, that's all. I mean, you know, I rather would have said it pithy and left it there. <laughs> well, but then it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't get anything clarified more. What I'm, what I would like to say based on what, uh, again, is that all of the things that you're saying I, I accept, I agree with that these, these are all issues historically, theoretically, conceptually, emotionally, religiously, but, in, but that whole problem could still be couched in how best do we serve God, right? How best do we do it by being very punctiliously uh, subservient or has God said, well, show me a little initiative and look, that's the way it is anyway. I, I, I'm, I'm in your world here, so um, you know, do it. What the Zohar is doing is pushing this just a little bit further because David, when David says, take the Kohanim and let them sing, David not, is not trying to, to answer God's mandate. God, God's mandate is let the Levites sing. And David knows this, according to the Zohar. What David is saying is, give me a break. Give me a break, make me happy, right? Let's go beyond your mandate and do this, do this once for me. You're right, in the, in the temple, we'll do it your way. But right now, be a guest and not, and not the, the boss. Let me be the boss. That, so I think it takes what you were talking about, it takes it a step further, no? Well, it, it certainly makes it more problematic because in this world, 
whose world is it? I mean, you know, in, in the metaphor, there's a distinction that's fairly clear, but the mixture of seeing Shechina as God's presence in the world makes it much more complicated because God's presence in the world, religion is an artifact in human history and human society. So there's, so that, let me just riff a little bit on, on what you were just saying, whose world is it? So we have a verse, Lashem Ha'aretz Umaloa, Tevel Yoshveva. Right, it's in the, in the, the Psalm that we sing on, on Sundays and when we put the Torah back on a weekday and so on. Right. Um, that to God belongs the whole earth and everything in it, right? And its fullness. Lashem Ha'aretz Umaloa. So that's, that's, that's one verse. Then in another verse, it says, Hashamayim Shamayim Lashem, the Ha'aretz Natan Levnei Adam. Right. That heaven is, belongs to God and the earth God gave to human beings. Right. So the, so the rabbi said, so which one is it? Whose earth is it? So their answer is, Kan Kodem Bracha, Kan Leachar Bracha. So they said, this is before you make a bracha, and this is after you make a bracha. <laughs> There's nothing like a lawyer to settle a hard problem. <laughs> That's what they, these are the rabbis are the great lawyers. <laughs> so, so they said, this is before the bracha, and this is after the bracha. So what does that mean? So most people explain it to mean that the, the world is... God's, Lashem Aretz Umloa, world is God's, but then if you make a bracha, then God gives it to you. Then you can eat the apple. Then, you know, once you make the bracha, then you can, then you can eat the piece of bread, you can have the, you know, you can enjoy the world. So before the bracha, before it, it's God's, and then when you make the bracha and you, and you bow to God, then God lets you have the world. But it's so, contingent so, on your wait, wait. It's contingent so, on 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 your obeisance. But there's another another uh, uh, explanation. The other explanation is the opposite. The other explanation is here is before the bracha. Before you make a bracha, you think you have the world. You think that the world is yours. But then, when you make a bracha, that's when it's Hashemayim Shemayim Lashem. That's when you say, "Oh God." This is your apple. So, uh, um, so it goes in the completely opposite direction. Yeah, what do you want to say? Well, I, I, I was actually just going to make a joke. Now you, you, you've muted yourself. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to make a little joke, but, but what you said is much more profound than anything that I was thinking of. Because now the question is, what is the purpose of the bracha? Is it to take possession? Or is it to relinquish possession? And that's really Correct. heavy. That's really heavy. So I'm, I'm done. I'm done. All right, good. One down and uh, nine more to go or uh, 10 more to go here. Yeah, that's all. Good. So um, yeah, so what back to here though. Yes, this is part of the, of the, of the dynamic that's being played out here. And what I'm saying is it's that got that extra push to it. Where David is, it's like, like a kid, and this is another uh, uh, image that we have. Uh, those that uh, that studied the uh, Tanit uh, together um, have this. It's like a kid who the parent says to the kid, "You always have to finish your homework before you can watch television." And then there's a show on TV that the kid is dying to see. And for what and and somehow or other the kid like begs and pleads and maybe does something to endear themselves to, to the parent, but really what the what the is, come on this one's do you know please let me watch the, let me let me break your 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 rule, and 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 then the, the you know the parent is a softy, and the parent says okay okay okay, you know this time I'll 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 do it your way. So it comes out of the, the, it's a breaking of the mandate. It's a breaking of the rule that goes into 
this other realm of chesed, of love, right? That that uh, that that says, you know what? I you know I, I can't resist you. I can't resist you. So in the in the uh, in the Gemara and Tanit, there are a whole son- bunch of stories about a, a, a very uh, uh, intriguing character called Choni Hamaagel, Choni the Circle Maker. And uh, Choni had uh, he was like a, a magic maker. He could he could get God to do anything that 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 uh, you know that he asked. So, for instance, the Tanit story is about the fact that there was a drought, there was no rain, and they came to Choni and they said, "Look, we know that God listens to you no matter what. So pray to God that there should be rain." So I'm going to cut the story short. It's a very uh, elaborate story, but he makes a, a circle. And, and he says to God, look, I want you to give rain to your children in Israel. I'm not coming, I'm not leaving this circle until you do that. So instead of God saying, that's your problem. You know, you, you, you got yourself into, into a real tight uh, problem that God can't help it. And God gives the rain just the way. And, and Choni says, not this way, I want it this way, I want it this way, I want it this way. And Shimon ben Shetach, is the great rabbinic sage at the time. He's a little bit actually proto-rabbinic. And he says, Choni, you have such chutzpah. That's not the way you'd relate to God. Who do you think you are? He says, but what can I do? God loves you. God lets you get away with murder. So I think, you know, he's the misnagged, so to speak, back to your typology before. He's the one who's trying to keep things going according to the rules and regulations. And let's just, be subservient to the mandate, even though, again, as I say, being subservient to the mandate doesn't mean that in the end, God still doesn't say, look, you have to do it in your own best understanding, but at least you still have to do it my way. Um, and what Choni is, is doing, says Shimon Menchetach, is breaking those barriers. So, uh, um, and he says, what can I do? You're, you're, I, I'm angry, I would put you in jail, I would punish you, I would give you lashes. I can't help it, God listens to you, God loves you. So I, I, I can't help it. So now there's another chat. Adam says, time to put the kids to bed. Good night all. Okay, why don't you let them run around a little bit? You know, there. Oh, well, too late, he left. Okay, so uh, obviously a parent that's uh, imposing uh, their, their, uh, their, their mandate on, on the children. Yeah, okay, so back to this. Okay, so Rabbi Yitzchak is delighted. Rabbi Yitzchak says, wow, if I walk this way just to hear this, I'm satisfied. Okay, this is a saying that happens again and again in the Zohar. Um, this this uh, um, uh, similar exc- exclamations appear in rabbinic literature and often in the Zohar, as it says, and it gives you all kinds of citations. Um, but let's note that most of the time they happen with a walking story that starts as a walking story. So-and-so was walking on the road and blah, blah, blah. Here he's not walking on the road. Here he's sitting at the mouth of a cave. Right? So um, we, should, we should understand that this walking, obviously you had to walk to get to the mouth of the cave, but that's not explicitly mentioned in the story. And why did he get to the mouth of the cave? Well, did he get to the mouth of the cave because he's tired? Did he get to the mouth of the cave because the mouth of the cave is some significant place? Just like Jacob, when he gets to that place where he collapses, there, there's two ways to read it. He collapses, it's just totally arbitrary that that's where he collapsed. And other people say, no, that's a very special place. So uh, um, we're gonna have to come back to that. But anyway, we know, we know that he continues to walk along with these people. And he says, wow, it was really worth it. For this piece of Torah, unbelievable. Okay, so uh, we have a few more minutes. We can continue, yes. And uh, now we have one of the sons. The father apparently was the first teacher and now it's one of the sons. One of his sons opened saying, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. This corresponds to what is written. Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. Alternatively, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran, alluding to when Israel left the temple and were exiled among the nations. As is said, all the splendor of the daughter of Zion has left her, 
And similarly, Judah has gone into exile because of affliction. Okay, so we have A and then alternatively B. Craig, yeah. Yeah, I just want to point out something earlier in the session. You okay. asked at what point did someone command someone to arise, kum. And in the Torah, a few verses before this, we have Yitzchak saying to Yaakov, kum lech padana aram. Arise, oh, very go good. I didn't, really, I didn't think of that. Very good. Good, good. <coughs> very good. Nice. Um, something else to notice here. It gets the plot thickens. Right. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, these two interpretations, what are they? What, what's, what's the difference between the two of them? The first one, the correspondence is that Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran, set out for Haran. And that's the same thing as a, a man leaving their parents' house in order to be with uh, their, their uh, mate, right? Um, to, and to become one flesh. So what's the correspondence? How, how, does that, uh, how does that compare? Look at the note. Look at the note uh, 53. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. The verse continues, and they become one flesh. Correspondingly, Jacob left his parents and went to Haran in search of a wife. Okay, so that's one way to read it. What's the second uh, way to read it? What's the second way? What's the alternatively? Yeah, Craig. Again, the, 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 fir the first way, it's, it, his journey is one of ultimate unification. The second way is one of ultimate separation. Right. I think that's really to the point. I think that's to the point. This is what we had before, Rabbi Chia and, and Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon. They disagree about how to read that verse. Right? And Rabbi Chia reads it theosophically within the godly realm, and it's all about leaving and coming forth, the Kuchabrihu Hu comes forth and finally comes to Haran and Haran is, is uh, 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 the other one and the other one of course is Shekhinah. And this is a celebratory, wonderful, wonderful uh, process, wonderful journey. And Rashbi said, no, he leaves the land of Israel and he goes into the demonic world. He leaves the place that's holy and pure and he goes off now into a place of evil and, and, and uh, risk and danger and, and, uh, it, and, and loss. And now we have it echoed again. Right now we have it echoed again, except this time it's the son who comes up with both of them. So again, we have a kind of a, what we had before with Rabbi Chia and Rashbi, these, these two preeminent uh, um, you know, uh, uh, sages, now it turns out to come out really uh, uh, just, you know, almost glibly out of the, the mouth of this nobody. So when he says, when, when, uh, uh, when we have in the note that he left, you know, it's all about leaving your parents and then going to Haran uh, to, for in search of a wife. I think he's, I think Craig is, is, more, is more on target. This is him saying, this is about um, this wonderful, you know, necessary journey toward greater fulfillment. Um, and uh, it, I mean, it doesn't contradict what he's saying, but it, but it makes the point much, much fuller, I think. Um, so, so we have again, as I'm saying, a little bit of a, of a notification to us. Don't think, just like Rabbi Yitzchok has already found out, don't think all the Torah sits with, uh, with the greats. Don't think all the Torah is only, uh, you know, uh, uh, able to come out from these most uh, uh, um, special, uh, uh, learned and, and spiritual people. This, this, this other person who eventually is going to disappear from the Zohar, but look at, what, look at what he offers. He's got it just as much. Yeah, Larry. There's one in life, isn't it true that in life that every act of 
of uh, unification is also an act of separation. So that when you, when you leave your, you, when you fall in love, you in effect separate from your parents. When you, when you, when you make a relationship, you become independent. When you go out toward something, you're going away from something else. Right. So that's that's an important uh, uh, way of, of perspective that we need to, to look at. Um, is that is that the case um, when we keep talking when when we when we talk about this image, this ideal of divine oneness? Right. Does that come at a price? Does that come at a price for us? For us limited human beings, in order to connect up with one thing, we have to leave something else. Right, because our independence from God, the fact that we have our own world, you know, is, is in part because we're separated from God. But if we really cleave totally to God, we would be, we would be, part, of, we would be part of God, but we would give up our independence. All right, anybody else about this? And I saw Mark wrote something that's also good to, to look at, but uh, just on just to dwell for a, for a couple of minutes on this. Does look all unification from our understanding unification can only be starting with something that's not unified and putting it together as one, right? So unification in and of itself starts with splits starts with things that are not connected, and then we make the connection. So every time we have a unification, as, as what Larry is saying is, even when we have A and B unified into some AB, but each of them, because they were separate, they lived in some, you know, in, in, a, in some other kind of relationship with other things, and now are moving away from that to become one. I'm asking whether that image describes what happens within the, the godly realm. When the Kutcha Barichu unites with Shechina, is that at the expense of some other connection? Is that at the expense of some other uh, um, unification that is relinquished or, is, or, or even rejected um, when we're in our parents' house, when we grow up in our parents' house, we're part of that. We're part of that household. We're 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 at one with that household. So does does God lose, um, you know, lose something by being united uh, with with God's own self? Does that does does God have to leave some other place? Well, in a certain sense, the answer is yes. In self, there's no more in self. There's no more. Well, yes. So okay. that's, of course, from our perspective. Yes, God leaves behind being in self. God leaves behind the unproblematic, undifferentiated oneness of of limitlessness, where all binaries are are washed away by the infinite blazing light of the oneness and God leaves that behind to create instead this kind of imperfect uh, realm of unification where the unification is contingent um, or, or temporary, um, where it's threatened, where it's uh, uh, never guaranteed. And yet, um, of course, it's still eternally true. So yeah, God, and that's part of, you know, going back to, to the stuff we were talking about before, that's part of God's leaving God's own home, so to speak, to dwell with us, to dwell in the, in the human realm. Mark brought up an, an, uh, an, another uh, important uh, image to think about, right? When, when Jacob comes to this place, and, and, you know, collapses to have his dream. It's at night. And we've been talking about how the whole world is sustained by the, by the journey of the sun. And then the sun comes down and sets. 
and we've talked about is that setting um, something to be uh, uh, celebrated or something to be dreaded. So Mark points out, he says, is the night a time of repose or is the night a time of danger? Right? Is the time is the is the night the time of of gentle, you know, you know, recharging uh, of life, and and letting everything quietly sleep to be able to get reinvigorated. Kuma Hashem, right? Get up the next day. Um, on the other hand, uh, night can be terrifying. Right? Night can be can be uh, a frightening time. Um, and, uh, you know, partly it's because of, of all that stuff that's not united with us. Rabbi, the reason I brought it up was that I was having a lot of trouble in the last session with this whole metaphor of Jacob as the son. Mm -hmm. I was looking again, you know, through my own jaundiced craziness as a kind of primitivism, you know, the identification of Jacob with the sun, you know, Egyptian sun worship, and you know, the Jews got all of this uh, accretion from, you know, all of these old mythic images. But I started, when I, when we were talking about this stuff, about the unification, I started to think that maybe there's really much more to the image of the sun than I was giving it credit for in terms of this tension between what you were just talking about. What is given up when you have to be an active participation, an active participant in the world, whether it's what God has to give up or what humans have to give up when they have to be active in the world as opposed to hidden in their place of repose. So anyway, that, 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 that was, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, no, good. And when we say, um, when we talk about the sun shining, of course, the sun is also, not just the darkness, the sun has that Janus face also. Um, it can be a source of light, but it can also be a parching, you know, uh, a fiery, uh, uh, you know, terrible, uh, uh, um, you know, hot, you know, force beating down on you. When, when, when uh, we have the verse, that it's like the, it's like the sun going out in its might, gvura, right? Jacob is is the sun because Jacob has that uh, combination. He's got the Abraham Chesed in him, and he's got the Yitzchak gvura in him. He's got the the fearsomeness. He's got the terror. He's got the, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the uh, shrinking away um, and the overcoming of that fear that requires great courage. And at the same time, he also has all of the, of the Abrams kind of like uh, um, just magnificent um, willingness to just go on and on and on with, 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 uh, with the goodness. So, um, yeah, these paradoxes are alive, alive in, 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 in all the different images. And just a, a pet kind of uh, idea that, that I work with, when we, when we talk about these comparative cultural um, uh, you know, uh, examples, and sometimes we talk about, ah, you know what they got it? They got it from the Greeks. They got it from the Babylonians. They got it from the this, they got it from the that. Um, Hopefully, actually, if people live in the world, they will get things from different people and from and from neighbors. But also, I mean, what I'm going to say is so trivially, trivially uh, obvious. We're all human, so we are all experiencing the same natural world with all of the effects that that world will have upon us in terms of our fears and in terms of our joys and in terms of our uh, wonderment and our need to make uh, uh, um, some kind of uh, coherent uh, uh, life for ourselves. So I'm, I'm not shocked when, when there is this kind of overlap or, or parallelism between one uh, culture and another, between one religion and another, between one language uh, or, or approach and another uh, with all of its different distinctivenesses. Um, the commonality should be there. 
because we're all we're all created in the same image and we're all uh, in the same world so how can it not be that way so you know the fact that the sun is out there where well, i don't need the egyptians to teach me that the sun is out there i just have to look up you know in in, in the sky on a sunny day so uh, which is not to say that the egyptians didn't do their own homework and their own experiencing and that i can benefit from listening to them or that i did but we all we're all getting the same the same uh, material to work with all right that's enough for tonight and i'm going to